I want to follow through with uh, what you've just heard from Professor Maj, because I think this is really about complexity in a different way. What we're going to talk about in a Congress on Biological Psychiatry is behavior and uh, the recognition that even though as psychiatrists we should be perhaps first and foremost focused on behavior, uh, this aspect of human experience, uh, we have been very primitive in the way that we've approached it. We haven't really been able to look at behavior with the, um, the granularity and the care and the sensitivity uh, that uh, human experience requires. So uh, we'll get into that in some detail. Just first, my disclosures. I uh, am working currently in the private sector with many different companies. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the work from MindStrong Health a company that I co-founded and serve as president of, although I am currently on leave of absence. MindStrong Health does not have a consumer product, so um, what we'll be talking about are some of the research projects for MindStrong. And I want to put this into the context of what all of us uh, today think about, which is that in 2019, we have, uh, in biological psychiatry, been able to um, push forward because of really three quite separate revolutions, neuroscience, genetics, and what I'm going to talk about is the third one here, the technology and information science revolution, with the consideration that that may, in fact, be the revolution that will have the most impact in the near term on both diagnosis and treatment in psychiatry. My introduction to this field was in reading an editorial uh, about oh, now almost five years ago uh, from Tom Goodwin in um, a journal called TechCrunch where he said at that time, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the biggest retailer, has no inventory. Airbnb, the largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate, something interesting is happening. That already in 2015, the world was changing in a fundamental way. And since that time, every one of us has had the experience that we expect to receive services and information in a very different way. I've been in Italy now for uh, for 10 days, and it's just been extraordinary to me how technology changes the experience of being in a new country, whether it's through navigating with maps, translating signs, being able to communicate with the taxi driver. All of this is a very different experience than it would have been even five years ago. In fact, we are in an era when we have come to experience that we will receive goods and services in with um, almost immediate response. It'll be consumer focused, it's virtual or digital, it is truly on demand and transparent with a tremendous amount of information so that we can comparison shop. It's also driven by us in a way that's proactive. That's very different than the way we experience healthcare. And if you can just see this quick summary of um, the opposite experience that most of us have in getting healthcare is that it's really focused on the provider. It's based in a brick and mortar clinic. It's often very delayed. There's very little information that consumers have and it tends to be reactive. You'll hear more from uh, Pat McGorry about how we're trying to change the reactive piece to get ahead of this, but so far we haven't gotten very far. So it's not surprising that some of the large tech companies have become interested in transforming health healthcare and beginning to think about what they can do in this space and it's been now um, less than two years since Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan, three of the largest companies in the world, decided to get together to create a new healthcare organization. Now, it turns out that the same thing has happened at virtually every major tech company. Tim Cook at Apple recently said that by 2030, Apple will be known as a healthcare company. Google uh, has launched a very large new Google Health I was part of a company called Verily that we spun out of Google, uh, and only yesterday the new head of Verily is going to, or the new head of policy will be the former head of the FDA, Rob Califf. So this is um, every one of these companies: Apple, uh, Alphabet, Amazon, 
Alibaba, and particularly the, some of the Chinese companies, have rebranded themselves and are creating powerful engines driven by machine learning and AI to begin to understand something more about how to deliver healthcare in the way that they deliver other services. And it's not just the large companies. There are now over 1,000 startup companies with a total value of something like $22 billion that have started in, in the EU, in the US, uh, in Canada, Australia, Singapore, and especially in China, uh, to begin to transform this space. And as it turns out, many of them are also interested in mental health care. Now, there are interesting issues about this because for most of us who come from the academic sector, this is a different world with different standards and different measures of success. It's not about publication. It's not about promotion. It's not about individual careers. It's about making stuff. It's about products. Uh, and it's about working in a team to generate a product uh, in a very rapid timeline. It's rather interesting because uh, when uh, I was at, at uh, Alphabet uh, at Verily, we would work with Google Search. And uh, you know, n normally when you have a paper that's presented uh, and is published uh, even in a great journal like World Psychiatry, you hope that it's read by a few thousand people. But at, at Google, uh, we would have a saying that uh, unless one billion people were using this product every day, it was still a work in progress. So the measure of success is at a completely different scale. Well, it was one billion. And when we did some work with the PHQ-9 and put that online to be able to collect data from people to measure depression through Google search, we were generating millions and millions of PHQ-9s every day. So a typical experiment at Google could take one or two hours to generate data from 10 or 15 million people. It's a different kind of science, a different kind of culture, a different kind of measure of success. And of course, one of the issues that we have to deal with is that, well, there is, I think, greater trust in the academic enterprise. There is, for good reason, a lack of trust in much of what's happened particularly in the large companies, but even in the, some of the small startup companies for technology. And we're at a stage right now where I think many people are asking the question about whether these digital technologies, whether that's the smartphone or the digital assistant or um, the uh, virtual reality headsets, whether these are really going to be solutions for us or whether they're just creating more problems. I'm going to suggest to you that like every new technology that's really going to be potentially disruptive, it could be both, and it will be both. Uh, and we're at a stage now where it looks for many of us like this is more of a problem than a solution. But I think for mental health, and particularly, as I'll explain in a moment, for beginning to define behavior with greater precision, this is, in fact, a potential solution. What is the technology that is part of this revolution? Well, there are many. If you just take a quick look, and these are from last year's data, which could be updated, but you can see that over about the last 12 or 13 years, there's been really a, a substantial increase in the use of smartphones and Facebook use, YouTube videos. Uh, incredible to me that a 1,000 hours a day people are watching YouTube. It's a little depressing to imagine that, but it is, in fact, the case. Um, uh, it's um, a billion uh, hours a day, I should say. Uh, Google searches were now well beyond the three to five billion uh, range per day. Uh, apps in the App Store, which were well past two million at this point. But all of this has happened in a very, very brief time, really in 12 to 13 years. As you can see, in 2006, almost none of this was available. And perhaps the most remarkable is the growth of the smartphone, which has simply taken off as a global phenomenon. I was in Africa about a year ago in a very remote area, and uh, it's stunning to see people who have no access to clean water or even to stable electricity or any kind of indoor plumbing, all of whom are carrying some form of a smartphone, usually an Android phone, uh, with them, which is just, to me, um, a remarkable observation that's hard to imagine uh, any other technology that has spread globally so quickly 
uh, in our lifetimes or in any previous lifetime. Again, what the impact of that will be remains to be seen, but we're still on a track to have six billion phones in circulation by the end of next year. So what does this have to do with mental health? And how can we begin to use this in a way that will help us to what I often call bend the curve, which is to reduce morbidity and mortality from serious mental illness? A problem that I think we have to address because, in fact, most of the numbers are going in the wrong direction. Now, it's true that in Italy, the suicide rate is coming down, but in the United States, we've seen a 33% increase in suicide since 2000. Uh, and it's continuing to climb along with a very high rate of overdose deaths, which has now surpassed the suicide deaths. So we are looking at um, what in the United States we call mental health crisis because of not just the high morbidity and mortality, but the increasing morbidity and mortality from serious mental illness. And we've had to ask the question, why have we failed? What have we done wrong? We have more drugs than ever before. We have more, treat more people in treatment than ever before. Uh, we have more people in the workforce than ever before. And yet, the numbers are going in the wrong direction. Why is that? Well, lots of, uh, to go back to Professor Maj's comment on complexity, there's not one explanation. I think there's several. One piece of it is that, as he mentioned, our diagnostic system is badly flawed. It has no real connection to biological validity. Another huge problem, unlike other areas of medicine, is that more than half of the people with mental illness are not in treatment. They're not coming to see us. They don't want to see us. The quality of care that we deliver is often very fragmented, uh, episodic and reactive. I was in Trieste last week where I must say the um, the quality of care was considerably better than what I've seen in most places because it was very proactive uh, and uh, very much uh, focused on community service and visiting people at home. But that's an exception still for most parts of the globe. And most of all for me, I think, is this lack of measurement that uh, it's often said in the business world, we don't manage what we don't measure. And here we do not either measure or manage well. In fact, what we do in terms of measuring mood, cognition, and behavior, is to ask people how they're feeling. We do that when they come in to see us, usually in a crisis. We do it on our terms in a clinic, and we do it in a way that it takes a lot of time and costs a lot of money. What we would love, of course, is to have a system where you could catch information objectively, continuously, ecologically, and hopefully passively. I often refer to this quote from Phil Tetlock, uh, that if you don't get feedback, your confidence grows much faster than your accuracy. So in mental health, uh, arguably, the fact that we don't measure what we do, particularly in the course of treatment, is one explanation why we often don't see people getting better, even though we feel that we're doing a very good job. Digital phenotyping is this new interesting area of combining technology and behavioral science to try to get this new window into how people are doing because especially young people are spending so much time on their smartphones. So the question is, can we use the information from the phone to understand something about their mental state, how they're feeling, how they're thinking, how they're behaving? There are sensors on the phone that capture activity, that capture location, GPS, and even sociality by just looking at texting out versus texting in, calls out versus calls in, is that a measure of how someone is connecting to the social world? Voice and speech are, of course, we've known for years, a powerful way of getting at someone's mood and someone's cognition. You can look at sentiment, you can look at prosody, you can look at coherence. I want to focus on the middle part of this, what we call the human-computer interaction, or HCI, which is the keyboard effect. Uh, where we're going to look at just how people uh, interact with the keyboard as a measure of how they're doing. By the way, I'm not going to talk about one other aspect of this digital phenotype, which we sometimes call the digital exhaust, which you could imagine is perhaps the most uh, revealing, someone's social media posts or their search terms or what an AI assistant is picking up. 
but for many people that is a bridge too far and is an invasion of privacy. The great thing about the human computer interaction is that in this case, we're not collecting any content. We're just looking at how people look, type, not what they type. So it's essentially looking at the latency between hitting the space bar, hitting a character, hitting delete, and hitting delete a second time. Those kinds of changes, scroll and click. So these are almost psychomotor patterns. And remarkably, we do them a lot, and they're very informative. Through the power of machine learning, we can begin to pull out the features that create this kind of digital phenotype. The first study with this that was done by Paul Dagum, who founded the company um, about three or four years ago, was based on just looking at a small number of people, all volunteers, where they had four hours of neuropsychological testing, captured a year of their phone data, and then another four hours of neuropsychological testing to see whether there were signals in the phone data based on this latency for typing, clicking, tapping that could indicate aspects of neuropsychological performance. And as you can see here, it's actually surprisingly powerful that with machine learning, and then you can do it through a replication as well, that there's a pretty high correlation between 0.7 and 0.8, which is about the same correlation you generate with test-retest variability on the very same measures. Paul went on to do this with a study of ketamine. He's looking at depressed patients. This is, I think, only 10 of the first patients that were done, but I'll just give you this as a sense of what the data looked like. And in this case, you've got patients who were depressed, given ketamine, they, um, they can remit, then they relapse because that's what happens with ketamine and they get depressed again, then they get treated again. So we use that cohort to, to sort of uh, tune the um, algorithms that we needed to understand not only what was happening in terms of this um, human computer interaction data when someone became depressed, but whether we could actually even predict depression before it would show up on a PHQ-9 or a Hamilton depression rating. These are the Hamilton depression ratings, but not on the day that the patients become um, depressed. They're actually, we're taking, well, we're, we're getting the Hamilton depression ratings on the day they're most depressed, but we're looking at their phone data from three to five days earlier. And you can see that we're actually able, with pretty high fidelity, able to pick up a predictor of someone relapsing following treatment with ketamine. It doesn't work perfectly in every individual, but in some people it works really well. It's still a work in progress. An example of how we're using this in a clinical study now with 500 people who are uh, patients with serious mental illness, many of them being picked up on discharge. And this just is looking at, in this case, two of the cognitive variables, cognitive control and working memory for one particular individual. And what you can see is this high variability in these digital markers um, the patient goes into the hospital. One of the problems for us is in the United States, when someone is hospitalized in a psychiatric unit, their phone is taken away, so we get no data when they're in the hospital. But when she, re when she is discharged, you can see how the data become far less chaotic, and we're able to pick up a more typical tracing. Again, this isn't a direct measure of cognitive control or working memory, but these are measures using these digital signals from the human-computer interaction. The idea here is we're working towards a system, and it may not be just one particular variable. It may be adding voice, adding sensors, adding human-computer interaction together to create a phenotype that does, for the first time, give us this continuous objective, ecological, and passive measure. The wonderful thing about these kinds of data, it requires nothing of the patient or the clinician other than the patient keep their phone charged and continue to use it. And especially for young people, the problem is usually they're using their phone too much, not too little. So this is one of the first things that I've seen in my career, in which we're sort of going with the energy that the patients have to get the information that we need that can be useful to them. And we're collecting this information about their behavior in an ecological sense, in a continuous way. So we have data not just every day, but almost every hour that someone's awake uh, and the data are, in fact, objective. This is also, of course, important for beginning to rethink diagnosis because this gives us this rich data set and an entirely new perspective on 
how someone is thinking, how they're feeling, how they're behaving in a continuous way. I think w the genius of Kreplin was he told us that if we wanted to understand psychotic illness, we had to understand it across time. And what I love about this new approach is that not only that we're getting passive data every day, but we collect data for months and years at a time. As long as someone doesn't throw away their phone, doesn't stop using their phone, and that hasn't happened very often. So with these kinds of uh, data sets, we can put together additional information, both cognitive and neural and clinical, to become, I think, better at a more precise way of categorizing, as Professor Maj was saying, these uh, syndromes uh, of very complex um, characterization. What I've been talking to you about is just really one part of what I think the digital revolution can do for psychiatry. I've been talking about the measurement piece, the digital phenotyping, <clears throat> where the sensors, the human computer interaction, the voice, the sociality could be very helpful. But of course, the beauty of this is that on the very same form factor on the, on the smartphone, you can also deliver therapies, a whole range of skill-based therapies. You can do crisis intervention. You can create platforms for peer support. You can imagine almost a global approach to this where you can have um, what Alcoholics Anonymous does uh, on, a, on a continuous basis where someone can be part of a community of other people that have similar kinds of issues. And there are companies that do that. There's also the opportunity to coordinate care in new ways through the phone and to create w um, platforms for data capture and, and quality improvement, which has become, I think, one of the most successful parts of so far of the digital revolution. This is the place where you'll find the companies uh, that are most successful uh, in terms of healthcare. For me, the critical aspect of this is not just that you have all of these different kinds of interventions and different measurement, but that you can create a kind of learning engine. It's a closed loop. So that when you do an intervention, you can immediately look at whether it's having an impact because you're measuring in real time and you're getting that kind of feedback that I was saying has been missing so consistently in mental health care. Now, not surprisingly, there are many, many companies that have jumped into this space and have uh, been trying to understand where they can have the most impact and also create the most value. Some are doing just uh, psychotherapy online. Some like ours are creating tools for better measurement. Uh, some have created consumer tools. Many are just you know, offering AI solutions. Um, I think the real value of this will come when all of this is combined. So it's not what we would say is an app. It becomes really an op operating system. And an example of how we're trying to do that is to combine the digital, digital phenotyping with an AI nurse who gives an immediate response when we pick up a signal followed by uh, what we call connected care, which is bringing in um, either a primary care physician or a, a mental health provider, um, and then providing to the care manager a dashboard that allows that care manager to know who on their, on their uh, uh, profile list is in uh, greatest need on any given day. So uh, it's best to think of this, again, as this closed loop system We've done this very well, I think, in diabetes, where we monitor glucose continually. We change the insulin dose based on what the continuous glucose monitor is picking up. That's the model, this closed loop learning system that we want to begin to perpetuate for mental health care. So what's the future? Well, I think if those are the problems, what I'd like to suggest is that we have an opportunity to address every one of them with digital tools. On the imprecise diagnosis piece, we can begin to get these objective, continuous, and really ubiquitous measures that we've been missing. In terms of lack of engagement, we know already that we can bring people into care who have not been in care through these person-centered online care um, platforms that people will use, especially young people will use to connect when they would not be willing to go into a brick and mortar clinic to see a psychiatrist. 
quality, of course, we can begin to address because we have the ability to uh, look at metrics in real time and we collect real data on what people are receiving in the way of care because every step of the care cycle is monitored. And so we know what people are delivering if they're providers and we know what patients are receiving if they're consumers. And then I've already talked about at length the, la the measurement piece. I sometimes call this a digital smoke alarm, which we can use for detecting the first signs of either recovery or relapse. The way we've been using this, most of all with patients with serious mental illness, is to capture them as they're being discharged from hospital. We uh, train them up on how to use the app. We teach them what to look for, and then we uh, follow them over time so that there's a daily readout of how they're doing, and we know when they're beginning to relapse from the signals that we can pick up. The World Health Organization recently published this, um, I think it was on Mental Health Day this year, uh, and I, I really like this uh, image where she says, I need to be able to get advice when I need it in a way that works for me. And increasingly, for people under the age of 30, and especially for those under 20, the population that Pat McGorry will talk about, the, that are having the, the onset of serious mental illness, what they want is not what we provide as clinicians. They don't want to come to a brick and mortar clinic. They get all of their services, all of their information, all of their products on their phones, and that's where they would love to get care as well. The only question is whether we'll be able to figure out a way to deliver that and get there to be able to help them. I'll give you one example of how this works on an urgent problem of, of suicide, where you can use the phone to be able to find out those signals that predict uh, imminent suicidal risk, whether that's classifiers from speech and text or um, aspects of what we pick up from the human-computer interaction. You can then respond immediately by either having a volunteer who's, a, uh, who's trained through uh, phone apps to be able to provide care or from social networks, and then you can provide the postvention, the care management and peer support, and continuous follow-up, which has been missing for many people who make a suicide attempt. My own sense of this is that the technology is simply a tool, that what we will need going forward is both high tech and high touch. I think the technology amplifies what we can do on a person-to-person, one-to-one, face-to-face basis. It's not going to be a replacement for that, but it does allow us to collect better data and allows us to respond more quickly. And I think it will allow us eventually to know who needs our response in real time? Now, there are a couple of issues to think about here uh, before we can imagine that this is going to transform the field. Um, and I, I think it's important because this is, uh, I've been in this field so long, there's a, a sense I have that um, for whatever reason, we're very susceptible to magical thinking in psychiatry. Uh, when I first came into the field, it was during a period of psychoanalysis, and everybody believed that there would be a single perfect interpretation. That was the answer. And then it was a single perfect neurotransmitter or a single drug that was the answer. Uh, and I worry that people will think that if we just have better technology, that that will be the answer as well. It's not. It's going to be uh, far more complicated uh, to go back to the theme of this meeting. But I think even for the technology piece, we still have to ask and answer this important question of does it work? Does it actually change outcomes? Does it improve how people are able to recover? And we have some of that data, but it's still early days. We've done, as I mentioned, about 600 people in a real-world project with an insurance company called Humana, where we've been able to say, yes, we can reduce hospitalization we can reduce ER visits, but we are just at the very beginning. And we still have, I think, much more excitement than results in terms of questions about saving time and money and whether this, in fact, will be adopted by patients and providers. 
I think even a bigger question here is the one that is now uh, on everyone's minds, and that has to do with trust. Is this a tool that will take us down a very um, risky pathway towards the end of privacy, towards um, selling a patient data, towards creating a world in which patients feel that this has been done to them instead of by them. So here I think we have to make sure that we've thought through how we use this so this isn't a form of surveillance. People have agency for the use of these tools um, and we have to get very clear about the use of the data. Who has it? When do they have it? Where do they have it? How are they using it? And if a, if a company, a startup company, uh, runs 500 to 5,000 patients on something like this and the company goes bankrupt, as many of these do, most companies don't make it, what happens to the data? And what happens to their obligation um, to the privacy protection for those patients? So these are issues that I think we need to think about very clearly. What I often say in talking to technology pioneers about this, uh, because most of the people I deal with know nothing about healthcare, they only know about software engineering. And they're the, the, the simplest way to say this is that you want to think about building tools that empower patients and families with information and connection so that you're using this to give something to people that they can use to help themselves. This is quite different from the way we often think in medicine, which is more hierarchical, more paternalistic. This has to be about empowering people to be able to make better decisions and get better care because they've got better information. I want to finish with this quote from uh, Bill Gates who said that we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. We are at an early stage for this particular revolution. As I said, unlike the genom genomics revolution and the neuroscience revolution, which both of which have been arguably going on for three decades, this is about one decade. So we're about 10 years in to thinking about the use of technology broadly and only about five years into thinking about technology for mental health, maybe even less, maybe it's more like two or three years. We're just seeing the first studies of large scale, real world kinds of studies. Most of what's been done up until now have been very small scale academic studies. We have a long way to go to show that this works in the real world. And as I mentioned, we have lots to think about to make sure that we safeguard privacy and we safeguard trust as we develop this tool.